Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Luz. Uh, my name is João Bill. I'm a co-director of the Brazil Lab here at the Institute for International and Regional Studies, and also a professor in the Department of Anthropology and uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School. It's a great, great pleasure to welcome you today to a, to a Brazil Today session. We, we have been fortunate to have counted with the support of Armenio Fraga, who's an economist uh, trained at Princeton. He, um, he, he earned his PhD here in 18, 1985. <laughs> <laughs> Some people say he's a man of the 19th century, but we, we surely know that he is a man of the future. So um, uh, he, stu he, uh, he studied international landing and the relationship between external disturbances, capital flows, and adjustment in developing nations. He presided over the Brazilian bank, Central Bank, from 1999 to 2003. He's also co-founder of Gavi Investments and a member of Princeton Board of Trustees. And we were lucky to have him here today since he's coming for a, a retreat of the, of the Board of Trustees that's happening this weekend. Arminio has recently created an institute focusing on public health policy in Brazil, Instituto de Estudos da Saúde. Da Saúde which is just being launched now and implemented by, by the wonderful Miguel Lago, who is helping to implement uh, the institute. Um, he is part of the, of the lab's advisory board, and we have had him both starting the Brazil Lab colloquium series and coming every time he comes to Princeton talking to us. So um, he has been really at the forefront of efforts to gather an intellectual community in Brazil from various fields. Um, from various you know, histories and trajectories to try to think what could come next, especially in terms of statecraft and, um, and the public good in Brazil in years to come, hopefully after, after the, the end of this, uh, of this period, uh, far-right populist period in, in, in Brazil. So he's also uh, a, a wonderful public intellectual. He told me he's just going to start to write a, a monthly column for Folha de São Paulo, Brazil's uh, top um, a newspaper, and he's and uh, so he is full force involved in rethinking Brazil and also his role in the Brazilian society and uh, public life. We are also very lucky to have Thomas Fujiwara with us today. So after Arminio will present some of his uh, ideas on distributive issues in Brazil and what to do about them. Thomas Fujiwara, uh, who is an assistant professor of economics here in Princeton, will offer some comments and kick off the discussion. Uh, Thomas earned degrees from the University of Sao Paulo and the University of British Columbia. His research examines the role, political factor, the role of political factors in shaping public policy in Brazil. And comparatively, he has studied why elected officials failed to provide adequate services and how the design of the electoral process can influence policy making. Uh, in one of his most powerful studies, he shows how improved political participation by disadvantaged citizens affected access to healthcare services and infant uh, health in Brazil. He has published widely, and some of the journals he has published is Review of Economic Studies, American Economic Review, American Economic Journal, Econometrica, and the American Journal of Political Science. So it's really a great pleasure to have our new back to his Princeton home and to have Tomas with us today. So let's welcome them. Thank you, thank you, Joao. I'm always extremely happy to be here. I'm even happier with the Brazil app. <laughs> and uh, I have to say uh, thank you and congratulations for, for uh, being off to a good start. I think this is very exciting for us down in Brazil. It's very exciting for me, because I think the approach taken here is sort of very Princeton-like. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, is likely to make a difference over time. It's, it's, it goes deep, is open-minded, is rigorous, just, just uh, what we need. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, very, I'm delighted to, be, uh, to play a small role. Now, today, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, inequality in Brazil. And, and this is something new for me, so you, you please be gentle uh, uh, and bear with me a little bit. Uh, I, 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 I always make it a point of highlighting some of the issues 
that I'll, I'll bring to your attention here today. Some are very obvious. Brazil is a highly unequal uh, country. Um, and and there, are, there are a lot of reasons for that. And, 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 and this is a must if, for instance, I, I were to be giving here a talk on Brazil, as I did in the, in the, in the inaugural uh, event of the, of the Brazil Lab. Uh, but today I'm going to zero in on, on, on distributive issues and I'm going to, at the end, single out some areas that might be, uh, uh, say, amenable to, uh, to change uh, in, in, in the direction of a, uh, of a better society, really, with the capital B. Now, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Um, that you, you probably have seen before with me here. Uh, I'll put it up anyway. So I just have this as a benchmark and I won't dwell on it very much, but what we have here is, is uh, a, uh, a chart of Brazil's income per capita uh, as a ratio to the US's. So I use the US as a benchmark, say sort of these are the, the higher standards of, of, of our planet. Uh, in theory, a country like Brazil should be catching up. It should be accumulating capital, educating, get, you know, get, getting trained, and uh, it should be open to new ideas, and et cetera, and therefore should be growing faster than the more advanced economies. It shouldn't be that hard. You can copy some things, and, and you can just add capital, human capital in particular, but also ideas and physical capital and so on. So what you see is, is we had a good run, uh, and then we collapsed, and then more recently we collapsed again. And the interesting part about the, the recent collapse is that it, it, it was very, very violent. This is kind of what we're going through. But underneath this, and this is the only point I want to make here, is uh, that most, most economists now believe that Brazil, and the guess economic historians and, and, and other social scientists as well, I, I hope, believe that Brazil picked the wrong model, the wrong development model. So during that good run up, Brazil was made a bet on being a, a, a closed economy, of sort of import substitution, with very little focus on, on productivity and, and education, among other things. So it's no surprise that even though we grew reasonably fast, and remember, those were the years of industrialization, and then towards the end of that, uh, run uh, infrastructure uh, uh, build up took place. But the fact is, with the model such as the one I'm describing, no emphasis on education, uh, it's no surprise that our distribution of income uh, has historically been very skewed, very uneven. Uh, and it's, it's really no accident. Okay, that's sort of uh, point number one. Um, if you compare Brazil with Korea, here you see uh, 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 the reverse uh, with Korea growing very fast. We, we are on top, Korea, uh, sorry, Korea on top, Brazil at the bottom, the other way around. But you see Brazil relative to Korea uh, really underperforming. What happened in Korea? Well, Korea uh, picked a different model. And a lot is, is, is mentioned concerning industrial policy in Korea and so on and so forth. But the, the, the bottom line is the following. They, they were gunning for the global market, so that gives you productivity, um, with support of the state, no doubt. But above all, Korea has been and was for, for years during the period they, where they grew fast, uh, faster. They were saving a lot, investing a lot, and also educating themselves Spectacularly, so now the, the average schooling in, in Korea is 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 is, is in the average person is in college. So they have 13, 14 years of schooling, and the and the quality of, of the education they get is is also uh, excellent. And I will show you some data on on, on income distribution. No surprise that with this model that their their distribution of income is significantly better than Brazil's. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, Next, I just this one. Um, I just want to mention that in the end, uh, we've had a re recently we've had another collapse, and it's often uh, not perceived as such outside Brazil. So I mentioned this for the record. I'm comparing here three periods: it's the 
this is Cardozo, Lula, uh, Dilma, Dilma Tamer down here. And what you see is we were kind of keeping track of, 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 the re of our regional peers, doing pretty well, then we crashed and you had uh, six years of, of two and a quarter percent below the regional mm -hmm. average. It adds up. And another way to look at it was it was a 10 percent decline in income per capita, with uh, 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 pretty pretty dramatic social repercussions and distributive at the margin. Although that's probably not the, the main issue here today. Um, now let's now dive into uh, uh, inequality. What I, ha what I have here is a simple Gini index, which is a traditional measure of inequality, measuring, is a measure of, of concentration. Um, the higher, the, the lower, the more equal. So Brazil has a, a, a Gini index. This one um, we took from, from uh, World Bank data uh, and is some measure of the net income that people get. You can also look at the market income, and then you have to add transfers and subtract taxes. This is the net. Uh, and what you see is it, in, is it need quite, quite a lot of progress uh, in recent years. Um, and, and included there are, 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 are significant gains uh, against uh, poverty, which is the better way to fight inequality. You could flatten everything from the top down, but you wouldn't want that. You want to kind of get as many folks up as you can. Uh, so you had the combined efforts, including the end of hyperinflation, a, bit, a little bit of growth, as I showed, and a lot of, and, and quite a bit of, 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 of effort on the social front, uh, both in, in the Cardozo and, and Lula years, more focus on the Lula years, but Cardozo also re redirected the state towards health and education, away from a bunch of other things, which was an important move, and for the very poor also, getting rid of inflation uh, was, uh, was very important. So what we see here is we do see uh, improvement, but it's still very high. And I'm not going to dwell on uh, here today, and probably I'm not qualified to do so, on, on uh, the, the roots of our inequality. They, they go back a long way. Slavery, I mentioned the economic model as a more recent one. But we've, been, we've had very durable inequality in Brazil throughout our history. And, and you can go back to colonial times, go back as far as you want, it'll be there. Uh, unlike, say, here, uh, or another extreme in China, where you had a radical communist regime for a while, was also very equal and, and very poor, of course, but, but very equal. The long-term roots, in the end, have to do with uh, a lot of things, equality of opportunity, et cetera. Short-term also, and this is important, and, and this will be one of my points today, uh, there's also what the state does. I'm showing you a curve that shows the inequality after the intervention of the state through transfers such as retirement pensions and, and taxes, both income tax and, and indirect taxes. Okay. Um, the, the thing about it, uh, in, in our case, that is uh, very worrisome. And now, now so I, I want to show you something that I think looks, looks pretty good, however, Look at us compared to um, a few other countries, and I pick, I pick the uh, uh, Chile in green to have one more for the region, the U.S. and Germany. Could have picked a lot of others. First, look at where we are here. I don't have Korea, but Korea would have been a 30 in this chart, okay? And we're still in the 50s. Chile is with us, also. Uh, very, still very unequal, it's fair to say, although they've grown much more than we have. So there's been people's standards of, standards of living over there improved more than in Brazil. In, in, in the US, it's been steady with a, a bit of a climb recently. Uh, this doesn't include Trump. Uh, we'll see what happens. Similarly with, uh, with Germany. Um, the thing about, um, I think, Brazil that is, is worth highlighting here is simply that we have a long way to go, okay? Yep, we're off to a, a reasonable start here. Maybe we move the third of the way, something like that. Or maybe if we're gonna go towards the US a bit more, 40% or even 50, but uh, regardless. 
uh, we still have a long way to go, and if you, those of you who know Brazil well, many of you do, perhaps all of you do, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clear to the, na the naked eye, uh, but in, at any case. Um, people often say uh, economists and, and sort of free market types are good at generating growth, and then they say social democrats or socialists, they're, they're good at distributing. I, at the moment, uh, uh, and vehemently against this view, um, and I think it would be hard to convince me otherwise, because I think we've reached the point in Brazil where, where uh, being so unequal uh, makes us unstable, makes us easy prey for populism. Uh, so if, when you endogenize, if you will, the politics, this notion that there is a trade-off really, I don't believe, applies in Brazil. I mean, you hear all kinds of colleagues of mine and fellows economists saying, no, there was a trade-off always. I disagree. I think we're at a point of the curve where, where uh, we need to do something. I think our situation um, is uh, one where people are, are losing faith in institutions, in politicians, in political parties. It's very messy. Uh, they're fed up. Clearly, they, they sent out some, some clear signals during the, the recent elections. Uh, but this is still there, um, and um, so we need to uh, keep that in mind. Um, now, it's interesting, uh, before going a little further or deeper into Brazil, to go back uh, and to look at um, the short term or the impact, uh, the direct impact of what the state does uh, on inequality, and I have here a, a this is a chart that I that I I copied, cu cut and pasted from Branko Milanovic, who was who's, who's, was in all his life at uh, the World Bank and is now at I think at, at, at CUNY, who does fantastic uh, international work on on the subject. And and here here we have two curves, one for the U.S., one for Germany, and what they show is at the top in blue is market income. It's kind of what people get. Uh, and then below is, is disposable, which then adds, so sorry, this is the Gini coefficient, okay, for over time for the US uh, and for, uh, for Germany. In red is the curve that I had before, roughly. And you see a, 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 a move towards uh, more inequality in the U.S., a little less so in, in, uh, in Germany. So this is market income uh, plus transfers minus taxes. Okay, so this is what people actually get. And you see market inequality going up in the U.S., market inequality going up a lot also in, in Germany. However, in Germany, once you account for transfers, taxes, then you see a, a reasonably stable, a drift, a slight drift towards a, a, a more unequal. Okay. Now, in, in the case of Brazil, I will show you the number. What the state does uh, improves the Gini coefficient, but not that much. So that's what, what I'm going to move towards now. So in, in a way, you could argue, and, and I, I, a lot of this depends on also how you calculate this. Uh, we have here with us an expert on, on the, particularly on, on, on all these matters, but particularly he's, he's done path-breaking work on the top end of things, which has become very famous uh, nowadays with the work of PKT and others, and, and, and it's, it's, pain, it's, it's, it's tough work. We have to really dig, uh, and Marcelo has done, done uh, uh, work on this area. So if we include the famous 1% or 1.1%, .1 then, then the story is, is even a little bit worse. So, so what I'd like to do now is to, uh, I'm, I'm going to blow up all my time limits I can tell. I'm not very, very organized, but if you don't mind, I'm going to keep going. You have to walk out. You have a good excuse. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, the thing about Brazil that is so bothersome, and we're, we're, I'm about to show you some things and, and, and to make some suggestions about what might be uh, something to do is that in the end, uh, a lot of people got rich in Brazil, let's say, quote unquote, the wrong way. Um, they were rent seeking. They were dedicating 
money and efforts to capture the state. And there was a lot of that from the very worst kind of outright uh, uh, corruption of contracts and so on to sort of a weak uh, political economy machine in Brazil poor, digesting poorly things. We've been very fond of, of uh, reinforcing a trend we see worldwide of, of companies having more market power. And that's the case in Brazil because we're a very closed economy. Some, and also we have these favorites who have access to cheap credit. And so we build these so-called national champions that tend to be inefficient. And but what, what do they do? They, they might make money off of the consumer in the end. So mm -hmm. we have all of that is very concentrated. These also led to, to, to lousy policies as well, as we can now say with, 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 with full confidence. And in the end, it's very poisonous. Okay, so this is all over the news. At least we have that. A lot of this stuff is leading to, to action. The, 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 the judiciary is working. Um, you could argue on, 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 on exactly how, fine, but let's, let's not get into that here. The fact is, a lot of people being tried, uh, going through you know process, being convicted, going to jail that you would have never believed. Very senior politicians, very senior business people. It's unbelievable what's going on. Very healthy, very unpleasant for those who go, but they, I, I really think they deserve it, and, and, and they're going through a system that is, they, they've been given a chance to defend themselves, and, and some have, but most, most haven't. I therefore believe, I, I might have said this before, I think we need to re-nationalize our state in many ways. Um, but uh, we can move on, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I, I sometimes say that at this point, I don't think the government should own any businesses. It's a different story. I think the government should be, the state should be the state and companies should be companies and we should keep them separate. That's my general view based on principles, but particularly in the case of Brazil based on what we've seen over decades. Now, so now I want to move on to this transformation of market income to uh, disposable income in Brazil. And what I'm going to present to you here is it comes from uh, work uh, published in a report of the Treasury. And I'm translating here, uh, redistributive effects of fiscal policy in Brazil is uh, from the, the ministry, then Ministry of Finance, now Ministry of the Economy. This was published in December 2017. A lot of it was based on the work of, of uh, Professor Rosani Siqueira from the Federal University of Pernambuco, but many others have contributed to, contributed to this over the years. I just, I just stole her, her charts. In fact, I called her up. She gave me a little lesson as well, but don't blame her for anything I'm about to say. <laughs> Although I don't think it would be very controversial. So here is a summary of, of that publication, OK? Uh, and you can look up her, her, Rosani's work as well. She, she's, she really has is, is done, done very well. First is just taxes as a proportion of gross income. Um, and you see here in green to the right, so the, this is for, for every, every uh, quintile. You see that at the higher end, income taxes, uh, indirect taxes in blue, you, can, you notice the, how important indirect taxes are. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> contributions from uh, to the pension system, all right? And you can see, first of all, that the a average tax burden is very flat, very flat. It goes a little, it goes a little bit up, but there I think is where we miss Marcelo's data. Which I, so I think we'd probably move this down. Am I right? Yeah, sure. We'd move it down for sure. Um, so there's. That's one. Now, the next chart, then, so this is, remember, we got market income, now we're, we're adding transfers, subtracting taxes, okay? So this, this is kind of flat, which, given what you just saw, the Gini coefficient and so on, doesn't quite seem right, okay? This is not a, 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 a talk on political philosophy or anything, but it seems to me wrong. Uh, this one adds transfers, so in red, I. I uh, you have transfers, um, and you can then compare transfers and taxes. And what you get is for the first three, for the first quintile, you get a tiny difference. Uh, and, and this here is in, is in real 
per month, per month. Mm -hmm. But the, the net is what we're after here, but I also want to give you a couple numbers in addition. And you see that it is somewhat distributive, but, but where it really uh, matters is in the middle quintile. And there, the bulk of it is, comes from pensions. Our pension system is, is, um, has some issues, as, as, <coughs> as Stephen was saying earlier today. You know, we have a social democratic European system with a middle income income. <laughs> Just so you know, I wrote down um, the incomes, monthly incomes per family, in this case, per household, for each one. I'll say it quickly, just so you know. So the folks who, these are families here at 700 reals, 2015, so you add 10, 15 percent to that, um, yeah, about that, because we have declining income, but a little bit of inflation. It's roughly the same. 700 per family, real, per month. So that's $200, $200 less than $200. Then for the second, uh, 1,000, one, $1,150, so $300 per family per month. At the, la at the end, it's about 6,000, and you went to the, into the last quintile. Okay, just to, just to give you a, a feel for what we're talking about. All right, um, from what we see here, and I don't have it, but you can read this report, they have all, all, many permutations. Um, you see that the tr absolute transfers to the top quintile are very large, and I'll have something to say about this in, in an international comparison two or three slides ahead. So now we have the, um, for which year, I forget which year, but it's recent, seven, um, 2015 or 16. This is from, from uh, Rosani uh, Siqueira as well. Um, this is what I was alluding to before. Remember, we, we were looking at this chart. So you see the US went from, call it 54 to 42, the Germany was went from 55 to 32, two-ish, uh, sorry, here to 36. Uh, in Brazil, if you add transfers, the Gini coefficient improves significantly. Uh, if you then uh, incorporate income taxes, it improves a bit more, and then with the indirect taxes, it goes up a bit. And you see, we go from 58 to 48, still a pretty high number, um, which is an, one of my, my main points here today. Uh, now, let's then move on and compare this with uh, a bunch of countries. Um, and you have, here you have sources here, Federal de Pernambuco and CI, Secretaria de Econ uh, Especial de assuntos econômicos. Especial de assuntos econômicos. Especial de assuntos Thank you. So here you have uh, for Brazil and, and the OECD uh, the following. You have in blue the initial income Gini coefficient, and then in red uh, the Gini coefficient calculated on, uh, using uh, disposable income. So you see, we. Uh, get some, some work done, but not as much as many. Mm -hmm. However, a lot more than Turkey, Chile, and Mexico. All right, just for the record. Um, now, um, another, another interesting chart also from, from them uh, is, looks at the tax burden and how much the Gini coefficient goes down after these transformations, okay? So on the left, you have, for instance, the Ireland taxes 20 some points of GDP, total tax burden, and with that, they achieve a massive reduction in their, their Gini coefficient. So you wanna be, you wanna be above it. I guess from a distributive standpoint, it's pretty clear, right? Uh, then you have, say, Turkey, taxes 
almost as much as Brazil and does very little, which is what we saw before. Mexico is here, Chile is here, and you can see they collect a lot less in taxes. I, I'm surprised with this Mexican number. I, I wonder if it includes all the states, all the provinces, and, and so on. But uh, uh, this comes from the OECD. So you see Brazil being, a, 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 of the developing countries, the one that taxes the most by far. So we have a tax burden of about a third of GDP. And we do improve some, as we've, we've seen. Uh, but we still, we could do better. That's, yeah, I won't, I won't dwell on this, uh, but you can, uh, uh, you can, you can look this up yourself. And then finally, in Brazil, I'm saving uh, the best, not this chart, the next, after this, I guess, I hope we'll get a little more fun. Um, then you have the following. We have here in blue, how much social transfers amount to as a percentage of the income per decile. So in blue is the first decile, the poorest, mm -hmm. okay? And then in red is what the folks are, who are at the top of the, of the distributional ladder, uh, how, much, how much they get in transfers. And you see in the UK, in Scandinavia, the folks at the top the folks at the bottom get a lot, most of their income, and the folks at the top get uh, nothing or very little. I'm not sure what's go what goes on in Austria. I, I, sh I sh should have looked it up, but for three years I had a daughter living there. But I, I was more interested in, in my grandchildren than uh, Austrian uh, social policy at the time. <laughs> but, uh, but then Brazil is at the end because you see that the folks at the top still get over 20%. Uh, in transfers. Well, I think a lot of that is probably pensions. Am I right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I don't have the breakdown. But we don't, we, anyway, we don't look so. so. So that's that. This ends my, my, uh, my, uh, my basic presentation of kind of where Brazil is. Now I'm going to do something that is more fun, was more fun for me, and that I haven't done anything with, and, I, 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 and, and it's not original. None of this is original. But, uh, I have some original stuff on, on, on the topic of reform of the state, but I'm going to save it for a future date. Um, that kind of <coughs> touches upon this. But, uh, but I, I'm now going to show you three slides with some ideas to do better. And as I said, they're not very original. What is surprising is that they haven't been done, to me, anyway, given that what we've had, who we've had in government for how long, you know, and, two terms of Cardozo, two terms of Lula, six years of Dilma, Workers' Party, uh, and still we are where we are. So what I have is sort of, a, if I somehow ended up in, in Brasilia and was advising uh, a, 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 gov a government, not, not this one, uh, I'm afraid, here's what I would suggest. This is the first initial, initial ideas, and I hope you can help me with this. So first, and this is about inequality, short term, medium term, long term. What to do? So long term, it's pretty clear that you need uh, equality, some forms. What you want and what you need is, is more equality of opportunity. You, you need mobility as well. And for mobility, you need equality of opportunity for, for a happy, healthy society. Uh, so we need more, more and better social spending. And here I'm talking basic stuff, and there's a lot of data on, on where the money goes and so on and so forth. But we're talking education, health, public transportation, you know, you go to Rio, Sao Paulo, people spend two hours a day, sometimes double that, uh, riding a, 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 a bus, sometimes with no air conditioning. Sanitation is a national shame. We are around 50% uh, of the homes uh, without it. Uh, and, and nowadays, even personal security, and as, as became clear with these elections, people are, are really uh, uh, anxious about that, you know, their kids, their lives. What do we need? I think we need two things. We need, and, and why? Uh, 
I think we need social security and state reforms. Now, why social security? Social security is already over 50% of our spending. We as a country are semi-bankrupt, by the way, in case somebody hadn't told you, I hate to break the news to you, but we, we're, we're really, really, really in very, very, very bad shape. Uh, I just listened to a presentation recently, six secretaries of state, secretaries of finance of states, uh, presenting what their situation looked like after taking office. So they all got in, audited everything, and said, here we are. For instance, the state of Minas, they had this chart. Wage bill over revenues. And there are limits, there are legal limits as to how high they can do. And they were just under the limit, 57, 58%. New secretary of finance comes in, new governor, new party, audited, boom, they said the real number is 75. Anyway, you got that, and that, that's all over the place. So we need Social Security reform. This is on the table. I might have discussed this before here. I don't know because I've been very involved in this subject. Um, uh, uh, I was up until a, uh, recently very involved in thinking about this uh, with a group of people down there. Uh, and uh, but I think we need it both for distributive reasons. Our system is, is, is full of, of, of uh, unfair provisions but also for, for just reallocating uh, resources over time. Okay, now, just so you know, uh, social security spending plus uh, spending the wage bill of, gov of government as a whole is close to 80% of what the government spends. And, and it's reasonable that it'd be a high number because a lot of these are services, but it's still a very, very high number. Uh, and if we're gonna be able to move this elsewhere, we need social security reform. If we're going to crawl out of our fiscal hole, we need social security reform. I think we're going to get something, but I think it's going to be tiny relative to the, the needs as, the, as of now. So we can be on the lookout for another one a few years down the road. Uh, but at any rate, the, the other one is, is state reform. State reform, what, what I mean by that is, is, is um, uh, has to do with, in the end, um, having the state deliver more with what it, it's got, and, 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 and I, I, I won't go deep into this, but it, without these two, I, I, I just don't think we're going anywhere. So proposals, do a very impactful and fair social security reform. This is being discussed, the government tabled a, 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 a good proposal, but I think shy, and it's being watered down, starting from the top because President Bolsonaro has never misses a chance to badmouth Social Security reform. Now he's probably scared, so they probably convinced him to uh, to try to get it done. But uh, for uh, up until two weeks ago, he would say, "Oh, if it were up to me, I'd never do it." You know. So this publicly, and state reform is not even yet not on on the map, but it, it's up. I think a, a coming attraction. I, I don't know what will happen, but uh, I won't I won't dwell into it. But I think without this, is hopeless, and our 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 statistics on, on quality of education, health, although they have improved some, to be fair, we have a long way to go. So if you're a positive person, as I tend to be, then there's a lot of room to, to do things. Second, now this is more shorter term, blends into the short term a little bit. Um, second thing one would like to do is to eliminate all this old Brazil stuff. Uh, I call it the low hanging fruit. Uh, in Brazil, we call it the, the Bolsa Empresario, this being the, all, the, all the tax breaks for businesses, a very pro-business environment, uh, makes no distributive sense. Sadly, it also makes no economic sense, no social sense, whatever. It's just terrible. So we had the BNDS doing a massive lending over the years at very subsidized rates, a total black box, but it doesn't, it, it's, it's very clear that it was not uh, 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 a, a socially worthwhile subsidy, sort of an anti-Robin Hood thing. You take money from labor savings that was was, be, was being paid a sub-market rate, and you lend it at also su uh, sub-market rates to to businesses who themselves are protected against competition by barriers, etc. So it's a, it's a it's really an anti-Robin Hood machine. Uh, we need more uh, internal and external competition. So here, I think we're doing things. Uh, so I have a plus, getting a, pl a, a plus grade. With the 
reduction in the subsidy that the BNDS pays, and, 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 and I think at some point we're going to have data to properly analyze what the BNDS does. I hope this government does this. It's been uh, a black box forever. They claim bank secrecy laws, but I guess they could uh, do with blind with some labels, blind, uh, blind uh, data. We have all kinds of tax breaks that uh, make very little sense. I'll get back to that. We have all the work done by contractors with their famously cozy uh, contracts. There's a ma major plus there with the Lava Jato. We have a very contentious topic uh, in Brazil, free education at the federal universities. They're the best of, of, of Brazil, and, um, and they're free, but the only people who get, can get in are, for the most part, people who went to private school. Many of those who get in went to private school. Uh, there's something there. This is a, not everybody is in favor of this, I, I am. I mean, you should give scholarships to those who, who need and uh, those who don't pay, you should pay. The tax breaks include some very hot topics because the middle class in Brazil by, say, US standards is reasonably poor. But they get to deduct uh, health uh, expenses, education expenses, and from a distributive standpoint, they are not progressive. Uh, but this is the middle class uh, by international standards is, is getting smashed. And that's another hot topic right there. It's included in the tax breaks. Uh, so I think there's plenty to do uh, here. Um, and some of it is getting done at both BNDS and in the world of, of, uh, of big uh, construction, if you will. And then lastly, there is the, the world of income tax. Now here we have, uh, again, I think, I believe, uh, low-hanging fruit to, to pick. Uh, first, the marginal rate is very low, it's 27%. It is true that people get taxed uh, otherwise, but if you didn't want to increase the tax burden, you could increase the marginal income tax rate and then lower some of the consumption taxes if you wanted to make it uh, a little more progressive. 27% is, is, is very low. But it's worse than that because uh, in, in many occupations you can form a single person corporation and then you pay 15 or something like that, which is crazy. And then, and then you can get your savings and put it in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an individual fund and you, pay, and you defer your taxes into the indefinite future. So I, I've been, I said it and I've said it uh, recently, but I think I was the first one to say it in sort of the business world. The, the rich, they, pay, they don't pay taxes in Brazil. It was the front page of the newspaper. I got a lot of call, friends calling me thinking I was some kind of new Fidel Castro. Or <laughs> I, uh, I treated them with appropriate language <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> one of them, anyway, never mind. Um, but this is big, uh, and, and, and even the, 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 the simplest regime tax regime, uh, they're called simples, is, um, is one that uh, is very, the, whose use is very distorted, distorted by, uh, uh, in favor of the, the world of services. So I'm talking prof liberal professions and so on. They, they pay very little. Originally, the, the, these regimes, these tax regimes were invented because they were paying nothing. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of it was done uh, informally, doctors, dentists, lawyers, etc. But I think we're past that now. I think that's not an excuse. I'm not saying, for instance, this simplis is, is, the, is the, the lowest uh, bracket. It goes up to, I think, three million a year? Yeah. Something like that, three million reals a year. So a, million, a million dollars. It's a million dollars, or say it's a hundred million dollars, and you pay very little. Uh, and I, I, I think now with um, more and more happening in, in it with electronic money, and that's kind of the trend, there are a lot of things we thought were, were impossible because becoming very hard, because you also have the, uh, the, the, the uh, um, tax receipts are also electronic now. It's very doable, you just, you just require a will. Just, just, you just have to want to do it. The simplest, which is this lowest, is uh, the subsidy is estimated by the Treasury in one, one point of GDP. It's, it's significant. Maybe you, you can't recover all of it. Maybe some of it will go back to the informal sector, but 
held if it's three quarters of a point, why not? Uh, <clears throat> so I mentioned, as a consequence, services are way undertaxed. And I've seen the study, I don't know that I can trust it, but it shows by sector, agriculture paying less than 10%, services paying 20% or so, and then uh, manufacturing paying a lot more, over 40% of some measure. Doesn't include the personal tax. And here's the, what I mentioned, tax deductions as well. So you could and should do a fair amount. Also, estate tax in Brazil is very low. I think you could, uh, could also do something there. Um, <coughs> there are other policies to deal with inequality. I don't want to dwell uh, on it here uh, today. This, this is kind of the end of my, of, of my presentation. But things like quotas, we have had some experiments with quotas that have been working well in the, in the, in the federal universities in Rio, for sure, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, including being competitive. Uh, and, um, but I, I'm just going to stop here, stick to the, to the, more, the more economic stuff. There's, there's plenty to do. I think were some of these things done, I think it would calm things down a little bit down there, I think, in the end. Uh, and then over time, hopefully, we would also be able to build something in, in the world of politics that is not so vulnerable to populism um, as we have uh, been throughout our history. Anyway, this ends my, my talk. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks uh, everyone in the Brazil lab for the invitation, and thanks Arminio for a fantastic talk. So I'll just spend a few minutes, so I'll kind of leave uh, enough time for everybody to have uh, ask questions and uh, debate. So actually, I have very little to add or and nothing to disagree with this. So I actually just want to just uh, kind of reemphasize two things that I think is kind of I can take of the talk is that is and. This is more of a comparative perspective in the sense of like, Brazil is an unusual country relative to other countries in the world, particularly two dimensions. One, it's much more unequal than almost any other country in the world, right? I think that came across very clearly. And one I think that you could see in those charts, but maybe may have, some of you might have missed is Brazil actually, the, the, the state in Brazil is actually very big, right? As you know, the amount of taxes that get collected and the amount of money that the Brazilian government spent is very big and it's kind of unequal in any country of the similar uh, kind of state of development, right? Like the kind of the tax to GDP ratio, the government spend to GDP ratio of Brazil. If you want to find some country that spends that, you have to go to Europe, right? And and if you try to compare it, in the charts, you see like if you compare it to Mexico, to Chile, to a Latin American country, to Asian countries, it's much smaller, right? And if you think like what does government supposed to do, right? They're supposed to redistribute and to provide public goods, which then makes this whole thing a, a much bigger uh, kind of puzzle, right? Like, you have this country that is unusually unequal, it has an unusually large state, and what those charts tell us is kind of, it does very little to actually move redistribution around, right? So we're kind of getting very little out of the, out of the, book of, uh, out of Brazilian. People who are now in Brazil get very little out of, uh, out of the, uh, what the, they do. And, and I think I don't want to actually want to also agree and uh, 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 <coughs> emphasize here is that perhaps like the I wouldn't say the, the economics or the logistics of the reforms that I mean you said they are not the, I wouldn't say simple but they're but they're not impossible like they, I mean the, the economics the logistics so if you want to make the tax system more progressive that's we know how to do that in the sense you know you change tax rates you, if you don't want to increase the tax burden you just reduce the consumption tax you reduce the CMS you, the, you know, the taxes you pay on products you make no, you raise the taxes basis on, on, on richer people. You take away the deductions they they, uh, they don't like. So it's it's kind of easy to do, right? Targeted redistribution. It's a lot of people think it's very hard to do, but in reality, the Brazilian government is very good at it. So, like, say the Bolsa Familia, it does target the people it's supposed to target, right? There's plenty of people audit it, study it, and there's for a no, there's there's no zero leakage. There's people who shouldn't be receiving most familiar who are, but the amount of that is very little, right? So the, the idea is that the Brazilian government has the capacity and has the expertise and has the, the ability, and there's plenty of smart people around Brazil who can uh, uh, guide into doing this. We could have a tax system that was much more progressive, right? Progressive in the sense of meaning the richer people face higher taxes than lower, and the poorer people with taxes. We could have a system that did target things to the right people, right? So the, the, the real problem is a, it's kind of a political problem. It's why like, we have a government that, that uh, 
doesn't want to do it, or and it's not always say a government doesn't want to do it. It's, it's why you have a society that interacts with the government but doesn't want to do it, right? And I think one way to think about it is that a lot of the the, 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 the suggestions that media puts in the end is you can think for every single one of them it will create winners and losers, right? That you know there is a uh, quote unquote small business that will lose if simples was changed. You know there's people who are in the middle class if tax tax uh, deductions for health and education were removed they would, would kind of lose. So there is. It's how the society kind of uh, 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 kind of navigate this, which is the the, the, the really uh, tricky thing, right? And and I think in particular the the the, the, the pension uh, social security reform is a clear case of this. Like you know, it's, we reach a situation that is unbearable. At the same time, somebody has to gonna have to lose something, right? In order to make sense of that, is exactly who how was the society navigate that, and how uh, uh, the political process navigates that. It's kind of a tricky thing. So. Uh, so I want to end this doing two things, which is tell one, one part is 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 uh, being a little intervening in a positive note, and also kind of kicking a, a, a room for uh, questions and uh, debate from the audience. So one thing that is true is, is indeed there's a lot of low hanging fruit, and there's a lot of room to improve, right? You know, and and part of it is that you know there's you know, Brazil has, Brazilian government has the ability, has the capacity to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. There's obvious things to like. There's really low hanging fruit. There's things that are fairly clear that should be done, right? It's the question why they're not done. Or, and how do you do it? And in terms of kind of passing the baton of uh, asking questions, I think the question is, is what exactly could we do? Or what is, is, I don't know, you could ask questions on this, on, on, on what sort of is the front that makes more sense to make a more redistribution? Like we could do it on the tax side, right? We could say, we just make it, we don't really change how we spend our money, we just make it so that, you know, the richer people pay more and the poor people pay less. We could do it on the other side, on the spending side. We could try to make it so it's a, a society, they know that the, the, the money gets spent, you know, like say, you know, money, instead of subsidizing, you know, universities where richer people go, we should subsidize, you know, preschool for uh, poor children and things like that, right? So, uh, thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> what we want to do now, I mean, so before you, you respond or keep the conversation going with Tomas, let's collect a first round of questions that we might have. Let's collect a bundle of questions. And then, uh, Stephen, did I see your hand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, how did Brazil end up with this configuration? Because it's not a single administration. We have a multi generational picture that you presented. How did it happen that uh, a wonderful middle income country has a European high income a social welfare state? in addition to the rent-seeking configurations that you described. Is this typical? Does Mexico have this? Does South Africa have this? Indonesia? Or is this peculiar to Brazil? And if so, what's the explanation? Okay. Marcelo, do you want to keep in the conversation? <laughs> oh, oh, Lorraine? Okay. What Marcelo thinks about his question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you made a comment right at the beginning that uh, Brazil made a bet on the wrong model and uh, decided not to focus on productivity and education, but you, you kind of made it sound like a strategic decision not to focus on those two things, but would you say that it's more like neglect and lack of interest in, in helping people, or would you say they thought, oh, we don't need to worry about that because we're going to focus on commodities, for example? I had a... a like an unformed kind of question, but I but it relates to what um, uh, Tomas was saying about responding to the question of uh, of state reform that you brought up. He said, but what about he said the political problem, <laughs> right? the political problem of the state reform is is that something at that level of political reform would a party reform like like because it seems so entangled with the ransacking of the state that you're saying, right? The state for rent, which is linked to a certain kind of ways political parties operate, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's a kind of a chicken and the egg kind of question. But I, I would like to hear a little bit more speculatively where you think something could be done in the political domain that then would make it easier for some of those statecraft reforms to take place. But I also could hear your Arminio saying, oh, if we do this statecraft reforms, then the political field will be different, hopefully, 
you were suggesting. So just you could, that chicken and egg question, if you could just specify it a little bit more. Should I? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't, I don't think this is exclusively Brazilian. You can go back to our colonial roots, compare us to, to the U.S. is a classic, Australia and so on. Um, where I think we, 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 so we, we carry these historical uh, shortcomings from way back. Uh, but at some point, uh, we might have done something different. Um, and I think here it might be slightly peculiar to Brazil if you take the case of Korea. Korea, in a way, made it compared to us. They, they, they picked a different model, but they were also, in the end, they were doing more than, than just producing to export. They, they were saving a lot, and there was a, there was a culture, I suppose, or somewhere in there, the, the issue of education got, caught the attention. It didn't happen with us uh, during the post-war period. It didn't happen during the, the military regime either. It's only later that we kind of woke up to this and we're still kind of struggling with it. Uh, but it's there. It's, uh, we're, we're, we're late to the game. And in the meantime, as you pointed out, we've managed to, uh, to build this very heavy state um, that is peculiar to us, and I think it, it links to Joel's question in a way, because it's a, if you want to reform a state that is this big, the, the, the politics uh, are, are complicated. You know, the, it's not like a small minority all of a sudden that, that's getting in the way. And so I'm, 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 I'm worried. And, and, and political reform uh, is, is also needed beyond what I'm calling reform of the state. What, what am I saying here? And I, I, I'm doing some work at the moment. We're, we're with, the, with uh, two other people. We're, we've just floated a, 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 um, a draft of a bill. It would be a lei complementar. We have in Brazil a, a type of law that requires uh, a, not just the majority of those present in, say, the House or the Senate, but the majority of the overall membership. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> So you need a large quorum and a, and a bigger than 50% majority because usually there will be people missing. So we're preparing something to do the following. Just as an example, uh, it, um, will, it would mandate that every government employee be evaluated, point number one. Uh, it would uh, force uh, curve, you have a forced curve, so you have relative evaluation as well. Um, and with this, you could impose some sort of meritocracy in government. And I, I really don't believe that government should be like uh, uh, the private sector, some of the more aggressive companies in the private sector. I, I actually don't, you know, they, they don't seem to be doing that well themselves, by the way. But uh, um, uh, you do need something. So in Brazil, you, you, if you're in government, you get automatic uh, pay raises. You, you get automatic promotions just p through the passage of time. So uh, our, our recommendation is to el eliminate that, and people could only, would only be promoted based on, on merit, on, being, uh, on delivering. Of course, the evaluation of a, of, a, of a senior manager in government will be different than someone who's doing some very basic work, but that's also true in, of, of, of the private sector. You still should have some sort of form of, of evaluation, and, and, and <coughs> this would allow something that is in our Constitution, most people don't know, but the Constitution does provide for the possibility of even uh, uh, firing people through certain steps. Uh, and I don't think we, we could ever have and should have in government the sort of dicta dictatorship you have in the private sector. But even in most private, uh, uh, non-government, bus no, real businesses, there are, there are procedures. You don't want uh, uh, you know, your employees to think this is at the whim of someone's mood on a given morning that somebody will, will be fired. But for government, you would need that. Uh, and then a few other things. But so it's a very basic idea. 
behind it is the notion that everything government does should be done with a reason. It should be designed to allow for evaluation. This doesn't require any changing any laws. It just requires changing government. You've got you to have a government that says, okay, everything we do must be evaluated, and we must produce the data for that to happen, uh, and we must do something with the analysis. This is a classic Angus Deaton, uh, I would say, for those locals. Uh, so that, you say, why, why not? It, it, it begs also the question of, of Social Security reform, the, the, the Social Security system of, of government workers is more generous. There I have some issues, quite frankly. I, 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 I do not demonize public workers. If you, if you take an exam, you study very hard, take an exam to work in the government, you, you buy into a package. You have a certain salary, and there are certain retirement rules. They're there. And you could say, I could have done something else. Mm -hmm. But I chose this, and then I, I, I'm counting on part of my pay is, comes later. So it's not the, something worthy of the kind of lynching I think we see publicly in Brazil. I've said this publicly as well. People think I came from the Mars. So it's not trivial to fix this when you have, you know, because you're really saying, you know, I'm reallocating things um, in, a, in, in arbitrary fashion. Mm -hmm. All of this makes it very hard. So I do think we, we will see something in the next elections on the world of political reform that will start uh, moving in the right direction. It will be the end of the these party coalitions that are done now uh, in, in pretty much f in freestyle, and, and when, when you end, when you force these things to be uh, national, it will reduce the number of parties, and maybe maybe that'll uh, that'll help. Um, but I think this is a very hard problem, very 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 hard problem. We already have a very long, large state. This state needs also, by the way. Uh, to uh, get its house in order uh, even before. Say we were to do Social Security reform and we were to manage the state better so that over time we could live with a smaller, slightly smaller state, maybe a couple of points of GDP less on, on, on either. These first four points, say two points in Social Security, I think we're going to get one tops. Uh, two points from, from state reform. These first four points, I think, have to go nowhere. They just have to go into uh, 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 the budget to prevent us from piling up way too much debt. Beyond that, then you can start spending. Now, people hate that. Say, yeah, but I'm not going to bother. <laughs> so it's very hard. Now, right now, there's nothing in the center. Famous lines of uh, Yates, you know, um, the center cannot hold. Well, ours didn't. You know, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a. Then, uh, lastly, on the on on why you know the strategic motive versus uh, neglect or what it was. I think this was a sign. Was a sign of the times. It was. A, or I don't think it was ever meant to be import substitution forever. The strategy was, you know, you do it for a while, but then you you open up. Um, we. We had a very heavy presence of the state. This was also before the Berlin Wall. So the state companies all over the place in Brazil, in telecom, in banking, in power, water, uh, fertilizers, mining, steel. So it's very, very uh, uh, much uh, uh, a creature of those times in the military regime as well. The military regime was paying more attention to investment than to social spending, but nonetheless, a lot of this kind of planning um, mode and, and, and deregist mode came back to us with terrible results more recently. So I, 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 I can't answer your question very well. I, I, I wish I could. Was it strategic? I mean, there was, a, there was no education anywhere. That, I think, was a neglect. A neglect. I don't think it was somebody say, okay, we're going to keep these folks ignorant and poor, so they work in our factories. And it was not quite like that, but but nonetheless, there was neglect. Uh, but maybe that could be part of the the long durée processes of exploitation yeah. and domination mm -hmm. that finds its way into this apparent neglect. But there's a long durée of of having surplus bodies 
to to produce at a low cost. Yeah, it could be. It could be. But whether it's a real conspiracy yeah, or yeah, they're saying, yeah. you know, the way I put it, or yeah. or something else, it's it's not for me to say. I don't. I just yeah. don't know. But it's a good question. Because striking, even like if one looks, or think about more inequality in terms of like. You know, ideas of race, color, etc. But also, even among immigrant populations, you know, you see, uh, even in the settlements that were supposed to improve the economy in the 19th century, it was a hundred years without health, without education. You know, and they were somehow revolutionizing and modernizing the nation. So it's really striking that uh, aspect, yeah. the long durée aspect of non-investment in human capital, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. We have one more round of questions. Yes. Much of my work is, excuse me, in Indonesia, so I'm looking at it from from that lens. And uh, a couple uh, related questions. Um, looking at the current situation and going forward, in terms of new investment coming into Brazil, it seems that much of this is coming from China, you know, so similar to what we see in other parts of the world. And, Indonesia in particular. And how does that uh, affect the possibilities for the types of reforms that you're looking at? Um, and, and then related to this, it seems like you know, Brazil has been making some very significant steps in terms of a push against corruption. And uh, uh, do you see opportunities for uh, new regulation in terms of things like uh, disclosing beneficial ownership and uh, reforming or putting restrictions on corporate structures where there's transfer pricing and offshore invoicing and complex corporate structures with shell companies outside of Brazil where there's a movement of, of funds outside. Just got one more question. Yeah. Yep. Yes, please. Yes. Actually, I'm really glad I mean, that you brought the, the free higher education. I don't see people talking about that in Brazil. It's, it's, the people, it's, like, a, it's like a taboo, right? Nobody talks. And it, another thing that actually, in, I think they are extremely connected to all the points, right, you brought to the, to the end of the presentation, especially like, but which makes Brazil probably unique in this case, in my view. You, I see that uh, it's, the mental, it's the mindset, right? It's kind of like a psychological problem that's, uh, let me give you a very simple example. Uh, I am a professor at so a public university. If I say like to a Brazilian with like a high educational degree or whatever, uh, oh, but you have to pay, right? So it's not free. Well, but it's public. But it's like people don't realize that. It's like a hiding cost. Like it's, it's really, really strange. And it takes like a long time for you to explain the basics. And uh, this is totally connected to the like the governments like running companies and and everything, all this stuff. So I, I, I always like, this is like, it's not exactly in my area, and, I mean, education, but I'm very, extremely interested in that because of my personal history, I'm Brazilian. So, so then like, uh, and I studied in a public school, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, right? And I, and I studied in a very good school, private school, my like, fundamental in high school, right? As most of the people, Brazilians. Uh, so the thing is, I'm always thinking about that, and honestly, it's, I, I don't think it's probably it's possible to solve this problem. And it's, uh, my question is, do you have any uh, silver bullet or whatever? <laughs> Something <laughs> that can you imagine you don't have an answer, but... No, I, I, I don't, but, I, but I'll say something anyway. <laughs> okay, great. Um, but it's a good question. It's a, it's a fantastic question. On foreign investment, um, you know, we have been... We used to be on the receiving end of about 1% of GDP of, of FDI for a long time, until the 90s. And then, and I don't know if this is causal, but... It, does have some role. Uh, we started to, to privatize, to open up. There was an amendment to the Constitution that says that if you're a Brazil-based company, regardless of whether your owner is Brazilian or not, you treat it equally. Um, and now we're getting even 
going through this depression, we're still attracting, you know, three points of GDP. At one point, we were attracting four points. Um, and it keeps coming in. Um, Brazil is large. I think there's a notion that most global players want to be there in one way or another. A lot of, a lot of this is re reinvested profits and so on. Some are intercompany loans. So then you get into the arbitrages, both in pricing and funding and so on. Brazilian government is pretty savvy about uh, staying on top of, of, of issues like transfer pricing and so on. They, they're sophisticated. It's no wonder. I mean, it's very hard to collect a third of GDP <coughs> if you're a middle-income country. Very hard. And if you start excluding from taxes, as you should, exports or, 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 or investments, not in income taxes, but in uh, say VAT type taxes and so on. And then of course you must exempt the, the poor as well. The tax rates that you must uh, charge to collect as much as we do are very high. So uh, they're sophisticated and they have systems and they, 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 they go after it. They're, they don't pay much attention to the microeconomics and probably as, as we know, I, I don't think by design, but distributive issues are not at the top of the list either all over the place but uh, China is growing but as a proportion of overall investment it's still not that high uh, they've been buy they've been paying up for some assets they are paying top dollar power transmission things like that and they, 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 they're, 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 they're there but for instance in Peru as a ratio of Peru's size is much more they're buying all the mining there uh, but the other issues we face, uh, some are kind of Indonesian-like, similar we share, I think. Now, on, on, on your question, I guess a matter of culture, et cetera, there, there, there are a lot of dimensions. I think one interesting dimension of, of kind of the current situation is uh, the connection between cause and effect at a macro level or a social level. I think it's been lost a little bit in a way, with the impeachment of, of, of President Dilma happening before things totally blew up in her hand, this is now like no one owns it. And of course, Temer, who was there and he was in bed with the PT, so he, was, he pulled out and he started trying to do some reforms and then he himself and his buddies, you know, they all blew up as well. But I think People in Brazil are kind of lost right now, and I think it's no 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 accident that, that we've had the the, the elect, electoral results that we now know. But uh, but this culture of of uh, um, of ownership um, is is missing, and it's almost like the, everything is free, um, and. Um, but you're still extracting a third of GDP. Um, so there's a, I think there's a lot to do. In the bottom, bottom line is there's a lot to do. There are cultural issues. I've always, and I, as a student, I, I, I always thought you know, cultural issues are, are hard to uh, really to understand and, 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 and w whether they're really deep and so on. Can you do anything about it? I'm in a sort of a transition phase. I'm reading about it more. In any case, even if we were to conclude, you know, there's a lack of social capital, trust, et cetera, in the end, is, it, is there really? Is, just la is it lack of just of education? What if we had people more educated? Would that survive as a, as a factor? I don't know. Anyway, this is kind of where I am. I'm kind of lost on, on that. I don't know that we can do anything about it anyway in the near term. In the near term, I think one, one thing we can do is to be ready. Because you know these governments come and go, and if, if you have some good ideas in place sitting there in the shelf, like we have now for tax reform, I hate to tap myself in the back for social security, recruiter, social security reform. We had something ready that was nice, progressive, clean, and they used it to some extent. They, they watered it down a little bit. They changed things here and there, but still, I think a pretty good proposal. It was there, and they, they brought our guy. The guy who wrote it was part of our group. You know, the folks who did this draft, I've mentioned this here before, but some of you may not have heard it. It was a group of seven that I kind of mobilized. Um, really good people, all government workers. 
Marcelo knows all of them, Tafne, Miguel Fogel, some are in the, working in the, in, in the Congress, Leonardo Rolim, uh, for sure, being one, uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro Neri, Paulo, Paulo no, Pedro, Pedro, Pedro Neri, oh. yeah. So there's something there. The clock is ticking for us, but there's something there. Rates have come down in the world, they've come down a bit in Brazil, so we're still breathing. But a lot of these questions, I just don't know what the answer is. And as of now, we just have this new government with um, no clear strategy. I mean, the, the economic minister has a very market liberal agenda, but it's there. Anyway, we'll see. Okay. Marcelo, do you want to, yes, please, to, to can, bless us uh, with some of your well, uh, statistical wisdom? No, no, no <laughs> definitely not. Uh, actually, I have a, a question that's maybe uh, it's going to show more ignorance than anything. Um, I, I try to be synthetic. Um, what do you think is the role of microeconomics in this inequality? If I was to put this in a very short sentence, what's the role of the central bank in this very high level of inequality? <clears throat> Monetary policy, uh, interest rates, and so on, and uh, exchange rates, and then what the impacts that that has on the, the Brazilian economy as a whole and you know, the trading sector. OK. Um, I think a salient feature of our macro environment is how high interest rates have been for so, and for so long. And that has to have uh, imp negative distributive implications. This is for sure. The question is what drives it in the end? And I've actually been studying this a little bit, and I, st I, I, st I, I have a, a co-author, and he was drafted. He's Tiago Berriel. He's in government now. He was a student of mine. One of the few I can say he was a student of mine because I was his master's thesis advisor. Not that I taught a class, because I haven't taught much lately. But So we've been working on it. I think that's a major issue, for sure, because we have totally abnormal rates. And they clearly don't, uh, they benefit capital. Yeah. So yeah, I think there is a clear, there is a clear channel, and it has to be addressed. Now, what, what is the cause? Is, 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 is a good question. I, rates have been coming down, but they've been high for a long time. Remember, I, this is one of my, this is talk, I could do, give an hour talk on this one, so I, I was re limit myself to a couple minutes more. But remember, we st I think the original sin was in the 60s, when they created the, the passbook savings that paid inflation plus six net of taxes. So when you put a floor, a retail rate, at 6% real is grotesque. But why has it persisted is, is, is crazy. Some of it is risk, but we don't really know. There, there are issues, there are a lot of explanations related to segmented markets, dual credit markets, low savings, et cetera, and all play a role. But still, if you do a cross section, we've done it. We're a total outlier. Yeah. So it's been slow. I thought when I came in 99, I, I should give, we should talk about this in private because if they hold you, just please feel free to walk away if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I, but <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it was after the Real plan, the currency was fixed and rates were at 20%, inflation was at five. Yeah, well, that was. So there was a textbook case, overvalued exchange rate, there was an exchange rate risk premium and also a, a, a primary deficit, so you had loose fiscal policy. So then uh, there was a fiscal tightening, a floating of the exchange rate, textbook. I was there at the time, I joined at that time. We, we however, did manage to keep inflation down, which was a huge yeah. risk. Yeah. So I do a little back pat, pat myself on the back a little bit, I was part of that. I thought rates were gonna go down very fast. They went down some, but they've been drifting down. And they're down now, but I really, I hate to brag about that one because we have 12, 13 percent unemployment, so yeah, please. it's a recession. So it's it's a hard. recession. So we're still looking. I, 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 I hear Tiago at some point was going to want to leave. It's in, it's in the news. So I hope when he's doing his uh, t cooling off period, we, we can finish our paper. Uh, but I think rates are drifting, and I think this will have positive distributive implications for sure. Then when you add... <laughs> 
what people pay is crazy also. But uh, then it's even crazier. Thank you. So I think we have to pause now, but before we just thank Arminio, just let us again, thank you so much, Arminio, for, for being such a supporter of the Brazil Lab, but also thank you for the work you're doing. You know, you're really, you're doing incredible work thinking almost like in that Hirschman mode, you know, everybody has the right of future. Brazil has the right of future, right? But also the sense of thinking, right, w you know, which kind of problems, which kind of interventions, which kind of ideas might be actionable uh, when the political scenario hopefully shifts, and then that can be worked with. Tomas, thank you, thank you. for being with us. Thank you all for joining us, and again, thank you.